All right, let's go ahead and get started. We've got a lot to cover today. We're delighted to have uh, so many of you join us. Crisis Management for COVID-19, week 26. The clock keeps ticking and COVID-19 is not getting much better. Uh, over a thousand uh, deaths in Kentucky now. This is not good. So we've got to keep wearing masks and taking all precautions. Um, we have a great uh, program for you today. Oh my gosh, we've had a little two week siesta here and a lot has happened. Uh, we're gonna fill up almost every bit of this two hours today. So hang on tight. Uh, no special guests because we just have so much to cover. In fact, we've pulled some things off the agenda because there's so much. Uh, Jim is back with us and he has got a ton of things to get. Just a lot's happened. Uh, Allison and Autumn are gonna be fielding questions and Chase, we appreciate your keeping track of everybody as they come in and um, keep bringing them in. Looks like some more are still signing up. So a uh, couple of things to cover with you quickly. Uh, the agenda, we're gonna talk to you about voting for a minute. There are a, couple of, a lot of things that have come up uh, that are really important to, to talk about and uh, we've kind of stuck with the COVID-19 but I'm going to make a little start making a little break from that because there are too many other issues you know we run HR for a lot of companies and we're doing a lot of these other things so Allison is going to give us a really neat update on some voting just some information Jim's got a lot of updates from the EEOC and then we've also got stuff from the NLRB and other organizations so a lot of us Congress didn't do much this time right Jim but uh, everybody else jumped in and did a lot. Yeah, I thought it was going to be a slow week until uh, everybody started dumping things on us from state to federal. It's uh, you all hold on tight because there's a lot of employer-based information that just came out. And it's, but I think it's helpful. It's going it, it, things that we are guessing at are now in writing. They've given us some That's direction. Right. So this is a good thing. But I want to say a word about idea. Um, look, sh uh, let's flip uh, that slide. Um, and um, so, you know, many may get a lot of updates from SHRM, and SHRM is really trying to take a leadership in this diversity inclusion, all the issues around that. And we've kind of a, a not gone to it on here just because there's so much other stuff to cover. But boy, if COVID wasn't around, the whole diversity, equity, and so forth issue would be huge. And we are dealing with it every day with our own clients. So we thought we'd start sharing that with you. We're not gonna do much of it today, but we will uh, coming up soon. And by the way, one of our good friends, somebody named Mary Chetty, who actually um, worked for us for quite a while, but she uh, is uh, the head of SHRM's, all the affiliates in like the Eastern half of the United States. Very talented lady. She's on the uh, diversity and inclusion task force for SHRM. Sharon has put together a lot of stuff. They're gonna be doing some special programs on that and helping employers with the challenges they face. But I thought this is kind of clever. This idea stands for inclusion, diversity, equity, and access. And the access one is something we haven't talked about a lot, but we're gonna have a special guest on that in the coming weeks. And um, it's a way to deal with the whole thing that in a new light, it's easy to talk about and easy, to, and, and I think it's a really positive thing. So. We're going to be sharing more about that. We want to give you all a little poll. It'll just take a minute, but we want to get some feedback from you to see what you think about uh, learning more about this. Next so, she said, John, I don't feel good. She said I had a side effect. I know this last week. I think we've got somebody extra on here chatting in. I'm not sure if she's responding to me or somebody else. But Allison, if you could put that poll up quickly, that'd be great. If everybody could just take a minute and give us your feedback on these topics. Is your organization currently making idea a priority or any of those things around diversity and inclusion? If so, what kinds of things are you addressing? We're breaking this up into a couple of parts, right? I guess you got to scan on down to get the rest of it here. Okay, we got five questions total.
Allison, can you tell when most people have finished that? Chase can. Um, <laughs> we've had about 55, 56 people answer thus far. Okay. Well, to give, give it another minute or two and see if people can finish it up. We appreciate the feedback. It just helps us the kinds of things that you might need. All right, let's go on to Let's flip the slide and let's just talk quick, briefly about voting at work because we know this is an issue, uh, you know, people are asking about it, you know, and a lot of questions on it. So we thought we'd just share some information with you that might help you in this, uh, figure out how to best handle this. Allison? Yeah, so I think everyone is aware that um, voting this year is gonna look a little bit different than in years past since COVID is a complication. Um, so we've had some employers who've decided to get ahead of some of the questions and go ahead and make it very clear to their employees all the different ways that they can vote, how the company will support them in voting, how their existing voting policy will apply um, to the, the new situation. And so I think that's a really good thing for organizations to think about if you haven't already. So um, there are a couple of different things that we recommend that you consider. So one is if you're interested, you can join Time to Vote. Um, it's a nonpartisan movement. It's led by the business community, and it's just meant to contribute to the culture shift needed to increase voter participation. So it is not a um, political stance. It is basically saying we just want to encourage our people to vote. And the ways that you can get involved in time to vote are either closing for business on Election Day so that people have the time to vote or pledging for Election Day to at least be a day without meetings so that people are flexible enough in their schedule so that they have the opportunity to vote. Um, however, and we can go ahead and move to the next slide, there is a different timeline this year for voting. Um, people are going to be able to go ahead and request um, absentee ballots, and I believe the last date for that is October, let's see, October 9th is the last day to request an absentee ballot. Um, you can check your registration or register by October 5th. Um, the timeline, so early voting is going to begin on October 13th and it will go until November 2nd. And then the regular election day polls will still be open, but early voting in person will be available starting the 13th. There's just not quite the information we want yet on the locations this will be held, but we know the dates. Um, and then the, the Kentucky Voter Information Portal and Vote 411 are great resources for either your staff or for employees to get more information about voting. So um, we recommend you take a look at these, send something out to your staff if you're interested um, and like I said at least think about how your existing policy will be affected by these different options and how you're planning to adapt it. So that's all. Great thank you Allison and um, I noticed that people are already starting to put questions down in the chat box. Um, if some come up for Allison will I don't see any on your topic yet but um, We'll sure get to them. Jim's already answering some questions. We've got a lot to cover. So Jim, why don't you jump right in if you want to respond to that one chat question out there, go for it and then uh, let us have it. Let us know what's going on. And listen, we're wide open for questions. So don't hesitate to put them down in the chat box. Yeah, I went ahead and answered all of the ones in the chat box just because I know that we are going to be running short on time, so I want to do my best to jump on those. But stay tuned, guys, because a lot of this will be covered in what we're getting ready to go through. So uh, I thought it was going to be a slow week uh, until I started to look at all of my guidance and all my little tickler lists that I have out there, and uh, it's not slow at all. So on, on September the 8th, the EEOC came out with a brand new set of guidance across the board, a tremendous amount of new things. We've gone through these lists. They were A was disability related inquiries, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, and some of them had to do with pregnancy and COVID. Some of them had to do with uh, reporting in COVID, uh, employee privacy, all kinds of things. Well, they came out with a whole litany of answers a lot of them are along the lines of what I told you to kind of do in the past, but these are now official guidelines and guideposts from the EEOC, which means if you don't do it now, 
you are going to be subject to uh, some uh, disciplinary action from the EEOC, investigations, uh, wrongful actions, etc. So pay attention to what's going on here. So the first one was, and this is under A because it's a question and answer forum. Uh, so under A, give me just a second, I'm going to pull some things down here. Under A, uh, the question A6, may an employer administer a COVID-19 virus test? Remember, you cannot do antigen or any genetic testing. You cannot test whether they've ever had this. You can only do a current virus test. We talked about that before. So it says, can they do a virus test when evaluating an employee's initial or continued presence in the workplace? This was issued on April 23rd. We did talk about it but it's been updated. So again, during the pandemic, employers may screen, test employees entering the workplace due to the potential that, that by, I'm sorry, there's a typo there. Uh, you can do that by employers consistent with the current CDC guidance uh, because it will meet the business necessity standard. Remember, you have to continuously look at the CDC guidance, the EEOC, this all falls on you or your workplace uh, healthy at work officer to make sure that they are up to date with all of this. And it's gonna get insane because some of these things are changing as we speak. Uh, I put the second note on here. I found this to be a little offensive and I'm frustrated with the EEOC, but I don't have a direct line if you do call them. Um, they place the burden on the employers to ensure that the type of tests that are being considered, not just the genetic versus virus, but now you have the duty to investigate and determine which ones are accurate and reliable. And then it suggests that you do a frequent review of the FDA site and the CDC site and review the false positivity rates. Well, I don't know about you, but and I, maybe I am a little bit of an expert on this because of how many weeks we've been doing this. By the way, half a year right now, 26 weeks in we've been doing this. Uh, I thought about that this morning and it's, it's insane. But uh, I don't think it's fair to call employers out and say that they have to investigate and determine the false positivity rates of various tests to determine whether or not they're, they are appropriate. Besides, if your employer comes in and says, I was tested this morning at CVS, how do you know which test was given to them? Uh, I went through the drive-thru at the First Care. How do you know what First Care is doing or Care First? You know, it, for them to put on there that there's a, this is an EEOC. CDC is a recommendation. It's all medical. EEOC is an employment-based mandate for employers to put on there that it's your obligation to investigate the false positivity rates, I found to be really ridiculous, but it's in there and it's written in that question. So it's your job to start investigating false positivity rates and make sure that you are not subjecting your employees or not relying upon employee tests that may not be accurate. All right, next one. May employers ask all employees physically entering the workplace if they've been diagnosed with or tested for COVID-19. Uh, these are, when you say on these, I shortened them because it took too much space. They're adapted from a webinar that took place on March 27th, and these are webinar question number one, webinar question number whatever. This is the new guidance though. And it says that employers may ask all employees who will be physically entering the workplace if they have COVID or if they have symptoms associated with COVID and ask if they've been tested. Then this is the part that I wanna make sure everybody understands because we've been asked many times, what do we do if somebody refuses? Uh, and there's one of you on here who's asked it a couple of different times and I'm like, it depends on each individual employee. Well, now it doesn't. Uh, the EEOC has finally weighed in and said an employer may exclude those with COVID or with symptoms from the physical workplace because they pose a direct uh, threat to the health and safety. Uh, screening cannot apply to routine teleworking and you'll see here in a little bit it gets in depth more about the, the refusal to take the test. Uh, if they refuse to take the test, you can now preclude them from coming into the workplace. 
So staying in the disability related inquiries, continuing on, the next question that was asked was, may a manager single out one employee regarding COVID-19 for screening, testing, or temperature? Again, this was adapted from question number three in March, but these are all new answers or newly tweaked answers. So this one basically is, can I single people out and not just require everyone? And the answer is, it depends. Uh, you can only do this if the employer has a reasonable belief based upon objective evidence that this person might have the disease. In this instance, whenever I hear the EEOC say, well, you better have a reasonable belief for singling somebody out, this basically means you better document, document, document. You need to know symptoms. You need to know that this person started to have a fever or started to have a cough or had any of the other uh, symptomologies, lack of smell, lack of taste, anything, or that you're following CDC guidelines or local governmental guidelines. As long as you're following some type of uh, health and safety guidelines from your local, state, or federal officials, you're okay. But document, 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 because when you, you know, the golden rule I've talked about for 26 weeks, treat every employee the same. If you're singling people out, by definition, you're not treating them the same. Uh, if you start singling out an employee, you better have a really good rational basis for doing it or you're going to be subject to investigation from the EEOC or from litigation uh, from the employee. So the next one, can screening expand to an employee's family members? This one is one of the most critical questions on here. The answer is no. GINA protects the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act uh, GINA protects any genetic information. So what, how do you get around that with a family member? How do you get around it in trying to find out what family members have, whether they've tested positive? Well, the, the EEOC actually gave us the answer, which is GINA does not prohibit inquiry, and it's this second part here, as to any contact with anyone associated with or symptoms of COVID-19. So in other words, what you do is you inquire about contact, not the familial relationship of that contact. So you don't have to know that it's their mother, father, sibling, brother, sister, child, aunt, uncle, or spouse. All you have to know is you've had contact with someone, anyone, who has tested positive, and then you're into your contact tracing. Do not ask about family members specifically uh, because that does get into genetic information that you're not allowed to know. It's a little absurd, but that's the law under GINA. All right, so the next question, all of these you'll notice are under the disability-related inquiries. We haven't gotten to B, C, D, E, F, G, or H. Some of them, there are none, but there are a lot in, a, in these. So. Uh, under A11, what can an employer do if an employee refuses to permit the employer to take his temperature or refuses to answer questions about COVID-19? This is one that I've gotten a lot of questions from a lot of you on. The answer is during the pandemic, and I'm bolding this because everything in this EEOC is during a pandemic declaration. As I've said for 26 weeks, as soon as the declaration of a pandemic is lifted, you are not allowed to ask medical inquiry questions. You're not allowed under the ADA to engage in any type of scrutiny unless it leads to the legitimate essential functions of the job and whether the person can do those. Right now, though, the ADA allows an employer to bar an employee from physical presence in the workplace if he or she, and by the way, I used he in here because I needed to save space. It kicked some of these down onto the next page. It's not a gender specific other than I was trying to save space. Don't yell at me, please. Um, so if he refuses to have his temperature taken, refuses to answer questions, refuses to follow an instruction for a test, any of the screenings that you need to do, you may bar that employee from entering the facility because they pose a risk of substantial harm to those coworkers around them. All right, uh, we're getting to the end of the disability-related inquiries, but this is a key, this area was key for employers to understand. Uh, and where we are here is uh, during COVID, 
only during COVID may an employer request information from employees who work on site, whether regularly or occasionally, who report feeling ill or who call in to work sick. The answer is during the pandemic, employers may ask on-site employees who report feeling ill or who call in to, to work sick about what their symptoms are as part of its workplace screening and protection of the coworkers. Keep in mind two things, three things. One, during the pandemic. Two, on-site employees. There's a completely different scrutiny and you'll see a little bit of that here in a minute on teleworking because you don't have the same concerns about a teleworker as you do someone who is physically in the presence of the location. And three, you have to be careful. This gets into that singling out that we talked about earlier. If someone is feeling ill or calling in sick, that's when you can start to scrutinize them about their symptoms and whether or not they have an issue. That type of question document what you're doing. Make sure you have the right people asking the questions. And you'll see here in a minute, one of the big issues as well is how many people in your organization are you allowing to have knowledge about this? Because privacy is a huge issue. Confidentiality of positive tests or scrutiny of tests is a huge issue. And the EEOC has in fact weighed in on that as well. So the next one, may an employer ask an employee why they've been absent from work? Uh, I think you will remember in April I told you basically you weren't allowed to scrutinize someone's off work activities. Um, that's a little different than this and you'll see that tweak here in a little bit because of the pandemic as well. But you are always allowed to ask someone why they've been absent from work and that's what they say. Uh, and I've summarized what their answers were because sometimes they took three pages to say one thing. But basically, under the ADA, uh, this is not and has never been a disability-related inquiry. You always have a right to know why someone is missing work if they've not asked off for appropriate reasons, not advised you they're going on vacation, they just take a personal day. You have the right to say, hey, was this personal or were you sick? If you're sick, answer the following questions because of the CDC pandemic. So. I uh, just want to make sure you knew that. Number 14 under A, when an employee returns from travel during a pandemic, must an employer wait until the employee develops COVID to uh, inquire of where they traveled? The answer is no. You do not have to wait until the employee develops COVID-19. You have the ability to question them immediately upon return because it is not and never has been a disability related inquiry. Uh, because the CDC, state, local are recommending that people who visit specified locations remain at home for a certain period of time, you may ask whether the employees are returning from those locations even if the travel was personal. Now the thing they didn't answer, and I wish somebody would, is the employer mandated to preclude that employee from coming back to work if they went to a location that is listed as a location that they're not allowed to go to or is it discretionary? And if it's discretionary, is the employer going to get sued or workers comp claims if someone gets sick because someone else traveled to Florida, New York, one of the hot spots that are listed or not listed on the uh, Johns Hopkins and the Kentucky site? They didn't answer that and I wish they would have because this kind of leaves open. Uh, you may ask the employee whether they're returning from those locations, but it doesn't say that you must quarantine or that you can quarantine. They kind of leave it up to the employer. I'd rather have you have strict answers instead of voluntary things. All right, so the next one, B, confidentiality of medical information. This is critical for you. What they've done here is identified limitations of information being shared, what to do if you obtain this information while you're remote working, a whole bunch of other things that we're going to roll through pretty quickly. If an employee, I'm sorry, if a manager learns that an employee has COVID or has symptoms of COVID, uh, how do you report without violating the confidentiality requirements of the Americans with Disabilities Act? And the answer is, if I can get it to pop in, 
Uh, symptoms and diagnosis are medical information and they are strictly confidential. However, it does not preclude you from interviewing the employee to identify potential contacts to notify them of a potential exposure. You're required to do contact tracing. You cannot reveal the employee's identity in doing so. So they gave an example. Use generic descriptors like someone at this location or someone on the fourth floor. They then talked about uh, for small employers, the EEOC is fully aware that you may run into situations where everyone will know who this person is because it's a small employer. You only have five employees. Your job is to maintain confidentiality to the best of your ability and manager's ability and to not disclose it among anyone that did not have a need to know. It, simp it specifically requests and requires that you identify a specific chain of people that you expect will have this information, your healthy at work officer, the HR person, and the person that does scheduling, for example. But you should not be openly discussing it. Your management needs to know ahead of time not to do so. And they literally included a recommendation that you determine prior to any incident taking place who needs to know, what they need to know, and how to protect the identity of the employee instructing those employees or managers that are notified how to handle it, what not to do, who not to share it with, et cetera. So that's new information that's out there as to how to handle a positive test. Boy, this is really tough, Jim. If you're I trying know. to figure out who ran into Mary in the office the other day and you can't say who Mary is, it's pretty difficult. I know, and now that's why I said this is now EEOC. These are mandatory. Yeah, so they want us to get to the bottom of it, but you can't, but you got to do it in a secret fashion. That's crazy. That's correct. And it's going to get insanely difficult because if, you know, you just don't mention the name. If there's a one-on-one -on -one meeting, then you're going to have to say anyone who is in a meeting in this location, in this office, uh, please go get tested. And then that person's going to know, but you need to notify each of the people that you're notifying of the con the contact tracing. You need to tell all of those people to maintain confidentiality to the best of their ability as well. The EEOC has said they understand that there may be disclosures, but it is the employer's obligation to not voluntarily disclose, if that makes sense. So do your best to keep it as quiet as possible. So he's tall, he has brown hair, and he works in that office right there. Yes, that's his chair. <laughs> that's right. <Yeah. laughs> so the next one, an employee knows that an on-site coworker has COVID-19. Does ADA confidentiality prevent that employee from basically reporting or disclosing the symptoms to a supervisor? Pretty self-explanatory, but just so that we're on it. Whoops, it didn't trigger for me. There we go. No, ADA confidentiality does not prevent the employee from disclosing it to the supervisor. Again, this is all about information sharing. You're not going to get sued for identifying it uh, to your supervisor. However, the supervisor must maintain it confidential, confidentially, identify who it is in their chain of management that needs to know, and discuss next steps confidentially so that it can be done in an appropriate fashion. Uh, last few on the confidentiality of medical information. Uh, an employer knows that an employee is teleworking because they have COVID or they're on a COVID self-quarantine. This kind of goes to the question this morning, which is why I said stay tuned. Can the employer disclose that this employee is teleworking without saying why? The answer is yes, you can, but no, you can't. So you can disclose that the employee is teleworking, but you cannot disclose why they are teleworking. So the only thing you're going to do is say the person's teleworking. If you need to contact them, here's how you get in touch with them. Uh, but you cannot disclose that they have COVID. Same thing on leave. If somebody is on leave because they have COVID or they have symptoms of COVID or they have any other kind of medical, any kind of medical condition, you can only describe that they are on leave. You cannot tell why they are on leave. And so this guidance goes beyond COVID and actually says for anyone who's on leave, you can't give that information out. But because it talks about COVID, and I know a lot of you have been pretty loose with, hey, you know, 
John's got to stay at home because of COVID um, or, you know, his child is out of school, honestly, uh, you can't even disclose that. They're just on leave under the FFCRA. You can't really get into why. And that's new guidance as well. Uh, many employees, next question, many employees, including managers, are teleworking. So this one basically went to what do you do with the medical information if you're working from home? We all know you have to have separate files. I call them red files. Different people call them different things. But you can't mix a person's uh, health-related information, time off requests, sick leave, FMLA, et cetera, with their personnel files. You must maintain that red file. Well, if you're working from home, you don't have those files. So the answer is you must maintain it confidentially. If you have the ability to upload it into a secure portal while you're teleworking, then you need to do that. If you can't do that, it's your obligation as a manager to try your best to move it into uh, as secure of a location as possible, making sure that you have locked cabinets, that you don't have any information that's being shared with other employees uh, or people in your home. Because one of the things that it also talks about is to make darn sure that you don't have uh, uh, your family members have access to your proprietary or confidential information, especially medical. So if an employee says, hey, I've tested positive, you need to try to maintain that confidentially and not have that where your spouse, your child, uh, your next door neighbor during a party can read it and find out that somebody's tested positive. Uh, so it's basically what it says to do. Then what you need to do is, as soon as you have access, get that information out of your house, destroy all the copies, and make sure it's put into that folder as soon as possible. Reasonable accommodations. This one's pretty self-explanatory, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time. I'm going to put them all on the screen for this page. So can you invite employees now to ask for reasonable accommodations? We've covered this before. They tweaked it a little bit, but it really wasn't much of one. Yes, they can start their accommodations for whenever they'll come back to work, and it's your job, if you can, to start that interactive process. However, they also say that if an employee doesn't take advantage of that, whenever they do come in and start to push their request for any kind of uh, reasonable accommodations, you have to take that into consideration even if they had the opportunity and didn't do so. So um, the next one is it gets a little bit more tweakish or a little bit more of an issue, which is uh, when employees are required to telework because of COVID, uh, are, you are you required to give the same reasonable accommodations as you would in the workplace? And if you'll recall, we talked about this at the beginning of April, and the answer is yes and no. You are required to talk about it. No, it doesn't have to be the same because there are certain things you can't do in someone's house that you would in a regular workplace or it becomes cost prohibitive. Throughout all of these, they keep talking about the employer and the employee should reasonably, rationally sit down and chat. Let's have a crew. You'll see it at the bottom. And it's in all of these. I didn't quote it over and over. Employers and employees should be creative and flexible about what can be done over and over again. Your job is to find out what could they do to do their jobs, how can we make this work, but I can't spend that much money on your house, so you know what else can we do to make this work? There's a couple of these. I'm going to put these, this one up on the screen. This is a big one. Uh, so when the employer reopens, recalls its employees, and I've gotten this question on this webinar probably no less than 10 times. Does the employer automatically have to grant telework as a reasonable accommodation to every employee with a disability who requests to continue this arrangement? The answer is no. Caveat. I'm going to jump in here and, and explain one thing. This is the EEOC guidelines. Unfortunately, as you'll see a little bit later, we are still stuck with the May 11, 2020 governor's mandate for employers, which says everyone should be teleworking. So keep in mind, this is EEOC, not state-based guidance. Again, EEOC says no. Our governor right now still says yes. We're going to talk a little bit about what he's done here uh, because there are some changes, but no new executive orders. So you're in a little bit of a limbo. 
because the EEOC, and if you wanted to try to rely on that, you could because I'm not sure his executive orders are going to have the power of law. I'm not sure that people are going to be able to sue for violation of an executive order. But the EEOC has literally said, this is the key part bolded here. If there's a disability-related limitation that the employer can effectively address the need with another form of reasonable accommodation at the workplace, then the employer can choose that alternative to telework. That's number one. Number two, you have the ability, and I'm not sure it's on this page. I need to look really quick. Um, yes, so number two, this other bold down here is the critical thing that the EEOC has jumped on as well. If you've allowed people to work from home, but there are certain parts of their job they simply can't do from home, I'm going to throw out a, a simple one. Your, part of your job is to get the mail every day, process the mail, scan the mail, and give it to the right people that receive it. Every single day, that's part of your essential job functions. You can't do that from home. We've excused you from that. Somebody else is bringing it to your house. You're opening that mail at home. Then you're bringing it back in and having someone sort that for you. That can be deemed, and that's a simplistic one. Obviously, there are many other related job functions but just one that came to mind. If that's part of the essential functions and somebody is not able to do that from home, the EEOC has said, if you have manipulated part of their essential functions of their job, you are not required to continue to do that if you are reopening. So if you're reopening under appropriate CDC guidelines, state guidelines, et cetera, you want people in the office and somebody refuses to come in again with the caveat of I'm not sure what you're going to do in the state of Kentucky because our mandate is still telework if at all possible. But the EEOC has said if there is an essential function of the job that cannot be performed from home and you have allowed that temporarily while you've had telework, if you go back to work and the person refuses, you do not have to allow them to continue to telework. So this last thing down here is the key. The fact that an employer temporarily excused performance of essential functions due to COVID does not mean that the job's essential functions are eliminated or that telework is a feasible accommodation. Keep that in mind because the more you reopen, the more you're going to get challenges from people saying, oh, I couldn't, you know, I want to work from home. EEOC says not so fast. The last ones on the reasonable accommodations, I'm going to put them all up on the screen. Prior to COVID, this one's key. This, the last three are really the most important. They're brand new. All right, so prior to COVID, uh, you rejected someone who had an uh, uh, inability to perform an essential function. Uh, they wanted to do telework. So they came into work because you said, no, telework's not going to work. Uh, now you have a situation where a person says, well, wait a minute, I've been doing all these things from home. Can they refuse to come into work and do you have to accommodate them? So then this one is that because, basically because you have allowed this person to work from home, now you have to reassess your previous determination that you couldn't telework to figure out whether they can perform the essential functions of their job while they're at home. If you, again, if you go back to the last question, if you've waived certain essential functions, then you're okay. But this will require you to do some review of your previous rejections of anyone that you did not allow to telework in the past because the EEOC is basically saying, wait a minute, you've now had a trial run at this. You should investigate whether you can make tweaks to their job and let them do it as long as they can do the essential functions. It's kind of a backdoor with all due respect, I think it's a little unfair to employers when they've been told you have to telework. Now they've done the teleworking and now they're saying, oh, hell, now you've got the experience. Let's see whether you can figure out how these people can do their job from home. Uh, so keep that in mind. The next one, um, COVID-19 does result in excusable delays in the interactive process for determining uh, reasonable accommodations because COVID-19 is a pandemic, because businesses are drowning, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, it is. The last one only applies to federal government, so I'm not going to waste any time other than federal governments have the ability to violate their timelines if they can demonstrate that COVID delayed their ability to review a reasonable request within the standard timeframes. Last one's on here. 
furloughs and layoffs. <laughs> I love this question. It's it's like the most basic uh, answer you could ever have. What other additional EEO considerations in planning for a furlough or layoffs must be considered? Don't consider race, color, religion, national origin, sex, age, disability, gene, or retaliation. Next question. That's like the most basic common sense, uh, but they threw it in there as a new one, and I was like, I don't know why we need this for COVID, but okay. Age. This is a critical one for age. You remember we talked about uh, if you have an older person, you can give them the notice as to what they're going to be dealing with. You can give them the risks of what they're going to be dealing with, but you cannot preclude them if they themselves wish to do the job. Well, this is a little bit of a different one. If an employer is choosing to offer flexibilities to other worker, may older comparable workers be treated less favorably based on age? Pretty simple answer, no. Uh, golden rule, don't treat anybody differently if they're similarly situated. This one tees up, they are, it actually said other similarly situated workers. Could you treat them less favorably based on their age? That's like a basic legal question. The answer is no. Never. Um, they get a little bit more, whoops. So we went to questions and answers. I thought they had another one in there, but that's the end of the EEOC. I'm gonna skip questions and answers because we have a lot, we'll, we've got more at the end, unless somebody wants to stop me. Lyle, you okay with me rolling? Yeah, let's keep rolling. No, nothing's right. popped up in the chat box, so let's go for it. Okay, I do see some questions in there. I'm gonna to try to pop in those at the end. Let me get through the rest of this because some of them may be answered. And there's a whole lot of things in this that um, dropped this week, last week, or the week before. So on September 11th, oh, sorry, a little precursor. If you remember uh, August the, whatever date that was, it may have been the third, or, or it was right near the third, the first week in August. We had a uh, webinar and I brought you up to date on the Southern District of New York. There was a decision made that basically said that the Department of Labor guidance regarding the Fa Families First Coronavirus Response Act were in fact not legal. Uh, I pointed out at the time, uh, the Department of Labor had like four choices. It could just say, okay, we'll just comply. It could appeal. It could tweak things, a whole lot of different ways that they could do it. Well, here's your precursor or your reminder. Uh, Southern District of New York, keep in mind, each district only controls its area. We have the Eastern and Western District of Kentucky. They only control the Eastern District and the Western District. That law is not governing anywhere else other than the district in which it is. With the exception of it allows other courts to take that into consideration and in making a decision in their ju jurisdiction, wait a minute, this challenge is before me too, that sounds really good. I agree with Judge Wood in what he ruled. This was, that's this guy's name. Actually, no, it's the next judge, sorry. Um, I agree with this judge, so I'm going to adopt it. Or you know what, I think the Southern District of New York is completely out of order. Uh, I'm not gonna, agree with them at all. You could have anything like that. Well, in this instance, uh, this judge in the Southern District struck down the guidance finding that one, it was unlawful that employees are ineligible if there's no work available, that the healthcare provider description under the FFCRA was too broad, that rejecting the requirement, I'm sorry, that he rejected the requirement of an employer agreement to intermittent leave saying the employees could just basically say, no, I'm gonna leave whenever I want, you can't stop me. And number four, uh, it rejected the FFCRA leave requirement documentation. So uh, I'm a little surprised by this because I thought the Department of Labor probably would appeal it because I don't think it was a well-reasoned opinion across the board. There were certain things that were, but you'll see in here that they really didn't change some things. They kind of tweaked language, but they didn't change it. But in response, the Department of Labor did modify its regulations, and this is now binding as of September 16th. So we missed last week, this came out last week, now this became effective on Wednesday of last week. So the first two, it's kind of funny because basically what they did was, all right, yeah, we listened to you, so we're making some changes, so now your order doesn't have effect, but he's probably going to re-rule on these. 
but his, the ruling of the Department of Labor is number one, I'm sorry, the changes. Number one, employees may take FFCRA only if work would otherwise be available to them. Basically didn't change number one above. Number two, employees must have employer approval to take FFCRA leave intermittently. That's the same as number three. Number four, I'm gonna skip number three down here for just a second. Number four, you must provide FFCRA leave documentation to your employers ASAP as soon as possible. In the past, there was inconsistency in two different regulations. One said immediately or before taking it, uh, and the other one said as soon as possible. So they tweaked that language to address this number four down here. Number three is the big one. They did make a big change to healthcare providers because in the past, healthcare providers basically was anyone who was in the industry at all, regardless of position. The Department of Labor agreed that that was overly broad. Basically, in the past, it was anyone in the, in the healthcare field, you didn't qualify under FFCRA, even if your employer had less than 500. Now, healthcare providers are only those employees who meet the definition of a healthcare provider under the FMLA regulations, or those who actually provide diagnostic, preventative treatment, or other services necessary to patient and patient care, and for whom absence of those employees would adversely impact patient care. Basically, this limits it now to nurses, doctors, uh, technicians, uh, lab techs, those people that actually work in the field that would impact ongoing patient care. They're not allowed to leave under the FFCRA, but secretaries, uh, file clerks, those people that are not involved in actual face-to-face -face patient care now do fall under the FFCRA. Stay tuned, that's going to be changed again, I'm pretty sure, because I don't think the judge is going to like number one, number two, or number four, but the DOL did not appeal. They just came out with new regulations prior to the deadline the judge enforced. All right, so now something that's not necessarily COVID-related, but I've talked about joint employer on here before. This is a brand new, yes, another Southern District of New York. This makes like the fourth or fifth. They're basically... If you're going to challenge the Department of Labor right now, you bring it in the Southern District of New York because of who appointed those judges, their lifetime appointments, which president appoints a judge, and where you can get favorable rulings based upon whether they were appointed by and adhere to more of the Democrat side or Republican side. That's not a political statement, it's just reality. Everybody's bringing these Department of Labor in the Southern District of New York, just like the last one. Well, this one. Joint employer is defined by the DOL, Department of Labor, Wage and Hour Division, as one who hires and fires, supervises and controls, determines the rate of pay and the method of payment, and maintains the employee's employment records. The appropriate weight, this is all brand new. This is not what was in existence in 2016. The appropriate weight to give to each factor will vary depending on how that factor suggests control in a given case. So it becomes a case-by-case -case basis. Joint employer, for those that don't understand, is you're, you may be paying the employee, but the person that, for whom that employee works or works with, think of a subcontractor on a construction job, uh, the one that I've represented a lot of, uh, temporary staffing agencies. If you are a temporary staffing agency, nine times out of ten in the past, you've been a joint employer under the FLSA. What this basically means is, regardless of whatever contract you have with, your, uh, with the company where the person is placed, you're going to be liable, and so is the person or the entity with, with whom you place that employee. Well, the Department of Labor came out and tried to very much narrow that. The September 8th decision by the, the Southern District of New York vacated a portion related to joint employer status for those that are uh, virtual relation. I'm sorry, vertical relationships. He left intact the horizontal because the plaintiffs in this case, 18 different states that wanted to sue the Department of Labor, uh, didn't challenge the horizontal. 
Uh, this gets into a whole lot of things about which one's horizontal, which one's vertical, but basically vertical are temporary staffing agency subcontractors or labor providers that have an economic reality that show that the person is actually working for both employers. That's the one that's been stricken down. The horizontal is where you work for two equal companies. It's basically not a placement by them under the direct supervision and control of the other. In red down there, you'll notice I've pointed out this only impacts right now the Southern District of New York, although I'm fully prepared and aware that this will be appealed because this is an attempt to set it aside for the second uh, circuit, which will be all of New York, all of New Jersey, uh, Delaware, no, Delaware's third, sorry, I think, I uh, can't remember, I think Vermont's in there and Maine maybe. So. Um, Stay tuned, but if you're a joint employer, just be aware that there are some shifting things with regard to virtual, uh, vertical and whether or not you can uh, get out of not being a joint employer under current guidance from the Department of Labor. NLRB came out with brand new guidance. They covered two different issues. If you have a union involved issue, just keep this in mind because it's very important to you. Uh, this is your water cooler talk. This is not getting engaged in uh, getting hit with things. But under Republican control, the NLRB is much less union friendly. Uh, that's the best way I can put that. So political activism little bit of a fact into what was going on in Maryland. A person was working for a company, unionized. He was a union rep for police officers, which is kind of what got him in trouble, by the way, if you want to read it. It's kind of funny because he's a union rep representing uniformed police officers. He's also a state legislator who decided to work on police transparency and accountability legislation, i.e. defunding the police. Uh, he was a union rep for the police officers and the police officers really didn't like him or her and uh, basically he got fired. He tried to bring an NLRB claim. The guidance here is pretty clear. has to be related to your employment or those that you're representing. Trying to do a uh, holistic approach to the constituents for the state of Maryland did not qualify as union activity. So he was not engaging in political activity on behalf of employees of the union and therefore had no protection under the NLRB. The second one, we've talked about this before, so I'm not going to waste a whole lot of time, but there were two different cases of advice that just now came out that's pretty much cementing the position. Employers have taken emergency action to protect employees, including PPE, including um, social distancing, hand washing stations, work from home strategies and other things. Common sense says you have to take some of those things without necessarily bargaining with your union straight up front before you do it because you're under a pandemic. Some unions engaged in challenging that action and literally bringing an NLRB charge because the employer did not bargain with them before requiring masks, before requiring temperature checks before following CDC guidelines and so on. The critical factor here that I wanted to point out, these, one was a hospital, one was a private uh, company. They, within a reasonable time thereafter, commenced negotiations with the union. The uh, government came in or the NLRB said, look, they took emergency action. Come on. They reached out to you immediately after or within a reasonable amount of time and said, okay, we, we did mask policies. We did personal protective equipment instructions. Now we want to sit down and explain to you why we did it, how we did it, and how can we do this to protect your union. And the union protested. And basically the NLRB is saying, look, pandemic, quit protesting when they're doing this, and then they come to you quickly after the fact. So those, those are the new guidance from the NLRB just came out last, last week. You'll notice if you've been on these several times, the emergency action, this one, uh, the second one down here, that's one that we've already talked about. So it's not really new, but it's out there. All right, CDC. I love the CDC. Uh, I don't. I, I'm very frustrated because the CDC has come out with 
I, I tried to do some slides on the number of changes in the last uh, two weeks since we had our meeting. And I'm not joking, it's at least 250 publications uh, in their newsroom. I, I went through and counted on Friday of last week, there were 15 urgent publications of new information that we're supposed to be keeping up with. And keep in mind, if you go back to the earlier slides, it's your obligation as an employer to keep reading all of these, but they keep coming up with 15 a day. There was no way for me to update all of those and get them to you, so I have given you instead the uh, website at the bottom. I'm going to copy it here in a minute, and actually I'm going to put it on the screen now so that you've got it. I'll dump it in the chat room while I'm talking about other things. But when I saw the number, there's no way I can do that and get it to you. Uh, so I'm just not going to do it. Sorry. Uh, I will dump it in there. But they came out with two things on Friday that I think are critical for you to know. Uh, one sounded a little bit like common sense to me, but everybody's taking this as like a sea change by the by CDC and it came out quietly on a Friday evening and everybody's like, oh, this is huge and they swept it under the rug. I don't know if they did or not, but they have declared that COVID-19 is in fact an airborne uh, with uh, aerosol as they call it or small water particulates in the air. It stays in the air for a long time period. It's not surface generated as much as it is airborne. So then they have uh, substantial cautions about poor ventilation in inside areas. Uh, so then what the bigger thing in this is, stay tuned, because I see this changing a whole lot of their current policies to try to implement some more protections, ventilations, fans, et cetera. So that came out Friday night. The other one that came out Friday night, they reversed course for the third time. You remember they reversed course on masks. Uh, uh, Dr. Fauci laughed at the importance of masks in March, April, and part of May. They just were not necessary at all. They will not protect you or anyone else. That was his statement. Uh, then he came out in the end of May, June, July, August, September, saying that that was only because they were worried about a rush on masks. Uh, that's not the role of CDC. If it's dangerous, he should have said it's dangerous. He shouldn't have said anything else. But on this one, they started out with a directive. If you've been within uh, six feet of anyone who tests positive for 15 minutes or longer, get tested. They came out at the end of August and they said, nah, nah, if you're asymptomatic, don't get tested. Then they came back out on the Friday night and they said, oh, wait, hold on. Uh, if you've been within six feet for 15 minutes, go get tested. That kind of change from our CDC is what's creating all of the frustration, confusion, mask arguments, debates, and so on. Everybody, if you want anything, you want to point to a fact from our CDC, 15 publications a day, they're saying both sides of every issue that I've seen out there, and that's where a lot of this frustration is coming from. So that's out there. Uh, there are literally hundreds. Um, I've got them. If you want to look at them, I'll put them up on the screen really quick. Uh, these are their updates. Um, these are today. Travel recommendations by country, deaths, cases. Uh, this is only through Friday of last week, Thursday, Wednesday, Tuesday. It, it goes on and on and on. I used to break those down for you every week or try to. Um, it becomes impossible when they're doing as many as they are. So hopefully they won't have that many in the future. I'm going to copy that and dump it into the chat message. If you have anything that this pertains to, Feel free to look. All right, Kentucky. All right, so last Thursday they had the oral arguments for the um, governor's executive orders. You'll remember I talked about those at the beginning of August, end of July, middle of August, uh, based upon whether the um, executive orders were banned or whether they were moving forward. The Supreme Court issued a blanket order saying statewide, not federal, they've all been struck, stricken down in federal court, but if you go to a state court, 
No state court judge can strike down any executive order right now. It's only done through the Supreme Court. Well, the um, Attorney General's representative representing the Commonwealth uh, argued on behalf of all of the citizens of the state of Kentucky against the governor who only represented himself and his executive orders because in this instance, he's only one executive engaging in triggering executive orders. You've heard me talk about some of the issues in some of those orders. Um, I'm not sure what the Supreme Court's going to do in listening to them. Um, I think they're going to fall on technicalities, but say no harm, no foul, because we're trying to protect the citizens of the state of Kentucky and the governor did things too quickly without following proper procedures, without declaring an emergency, but eh, let's just let it go. Uh, some interesting things that came out of it though, Procedural issues I see as a uh, kind of a side issue because I don't think people are going to set aside 800 pages. By the way, that's how many there are. About this thick, visually, if you're not looking, about eight inches thick of policies that have been adopted uh, since March by the, the governor. The reason for this being a concern is basically under the guise of a pandemic, um, the executive who executes on legislative activity is acting in the absence of a legislature. So basically he has become legislative, executive, and judicial. He's doing it all by himself with these orders. That's the concern from businesses and from the, the attorney general, not getting political, this is just fact-based. Procedural issues are, wait a minute, you didn't declare an emergency before you implemented these, so you can't enforce them. But the reality is, I think that the after hearing the questions um, and the argument from the uh, governor's representative, I think that that's going to basically be, okay, yep, you didn't do it right, do it right during the next pandemic. Uh, there were a lot of comments made by justices of, look, we now realize our legislature has really screwed up because it's given the governor unfettered control during him declaring an emergency without limitations. But that's not the judicial and it's not the executive that's a legislative's fault. The response to that was it's a constitutional fault. He can't go beyond the constitutional guidelines even if the legislature gave him emergency uh, relief from it. The problem we've got is our legislature only meets twice, once every two years, uh, and during any kind of emergency, the governor, but it's intended to be like a tornado. It's intended to be a quick in time and done. It's not intended to be a year long. That's the issue we're dealing with. So the question's based, basically focused on were his actions necessary and adequately tailored, which is going to be a big issue. Did he limit it only to what he had to do to protect the health, safety, and welfare, or did he go beyond? Uh, whether the regulatory policies allowed for public input, because under regulations you're supposed to have public input like they had on the unemployment uh, work share they had public, uh, they adopted it and then they just quietly pulled it aside same kind of issue. Um, and then whether the orders are reviewed, this is the interesting question that I'm not sure how they're going to do it. The question was to everyone, do we review this now, knowing what we know now? Because these orders are very overbearing what we know now. Or do we review it at the time that he entered the order? I wish I'd been there to argue it because the answer is you have to review it now because the executive order renews every single day until it's lifted. Nobody said that, but the answer is very simple. The order is in effect today. It must be reviewed under today's, otherwise why didn't he drop the order and go with a new one? So his May 11th order for businesses opening with a healthy at work, with the 14 different things that you must do or you're not allowed to open, has to be reviewed on September 17th at oral argument. It can't be reviewed as of May 11th because it's the same every day. The same with the other 800 pages. Somebody should have been very quick to jump on that. I don't know why they didn't. There was a whole bunch of different people arguing for different clients, so that might explain it. 
but that fell through. Hopefully the Supreme Court does it on their own. Uh, so the issue basically boils down to, can the governor dictate all facets of legislative, executive, and judicial because it's an emergency? How long does the emergency continue and how far can he go? The argument from his counsel was basically he can do whatever he wants. I'm not summer. I'm not being sarcastic. It literally was, look, legislature says during an emergency he can do it. This is an emergency. The president declared an emergency. He can do what he wants. Um, I don't think they're going to rule that way, but I do think that the governor is going, it's going to be a split the baby type thing, and the governor is going to win on a lot of it, but it's basically going to be uh, one of the arguments was, okay, we get the emergency up front, but we're six months down the road on these. Why haven't you had public comment? Why haven't you transitioned to a regulation? Why haven't you addressed it after the initial emergency? And the comment from the, the attorney general was point on. We gave you time up front because we all recognize this is an emergency. But at some point, you've got to follow proper procedure after the initial emergency subsides. The governor's position is it's still an emergency, so I don't have to do anything. I think at some point, you've got to take 30 days later, start presenting regulations instead of executive orders, start getting the legislature involved, call them back into session. Uh, they can't call themselves into session. He has to do it, but then he's not doing it. He's just issuing executive orders. So I, it's a mess. This is not what anybody intended. And the Supreme Court people, the, the justices were basically saying, look, we get it, but the legislature screwed up. Have them fix it. Well, they don't come into session for another four months. So meanwhile, businesses are going out of business and it's creating problems. So that's it. Opinion could come any day. Typically, it could take up to six months. I suspect we'll have one from them in the next two weeks to a month. Um, and then it may go to the United States Supreme Court if it could be interpreted that it, it could be different than other states and that uh, citizens of different states are being treated differently. Um, all right. Kentucky has promised new updates to the COVID pages. Some of them have been implemented. I went ahead and put one up on the screen here. They assured us that they were going to start working on some of these things that hadn't been touched in weeks, months, or six months. Um, so now they're doing total tested positivity rate and recovery numbers. As of today's date, they were empty because they were going to clean that up. I pointed out that the recoveries haven't changed much at all over the last six months, and our numbers don't match other states, and somebody needs to fix it. Total number of tests are critical because some people are being tested on multiple occasions. So your percentage of positives are being impacted by the number of people getting these rapid result tests five times, six times, and so on may not be accurate. So then they changed the map to actually be proper percentages instead of overall number of incidents. I really like the new map. I, you've heard me on this before complaining about it. So now you'll notice Fayette County is no longer red. Some of these are green. Jefferson's not red. It's orange. Orange is the right color. These are based upon numbers of cases per 100,000 people. Instead of just flat saying since March, we've had 10,000 cases in Fayette County. The other thing is they seem to have flushed out those people that came to Fayette County because they're sick but they resided in a different county and they're just getting treated at the University of Kentucky. So these figures are much more representative of what you have. It's on the website. Um, if you go to the, um, I'm not sure which one of these, I think I had it on here. Sorry, I'm trying to get to that page. Uh, oh, this is healthy at work. There we go. So it's on the front page of the Kentucky COVID-19. Um, I'll zoom in so you can actually see it because I know it was a little bit uh, small there. Whoops, where to go? Sorry, one second. Um, so this is literally average daily cases per 100,000 population on track is less than one. Uh, then the community spread is between 1 and 10 per 100. Accelerated is between 10 and 25, and critical is above 25. 
So now you know where you stand on actual cases, not just on historical numbers since the beginning of time. I like that one a lot better. Got problems with their travel advisory. Let me pull that back up really quick. I moved too quick. Down here, they've got a travel advisory. These are completely inaccurate. First of all, they say more than 10%. Well, you'll notice, I'm going to drop this down. Um, Florida, Nebraska, Missouri, and Iowa, all above 10%. South Carolina and Mississippi are below 10%. So they tell you to use this as your guide for anyone traveling to those states. But then how do we get Mississippi on there when they're at 4%? How do you have South Carolina on there when they're at nine? Why are you removing between 10 and 15? Idaho, Alabama, Kansas, and South Dakota are not your hotbeds, but they, they're doing this based upon percentage of testing. And those states are not testing everyone as often as New York. And on the Johns Hopkins, the um, if you go to Johns Hopkins, again, my concern with the way that they're doing this testing, you click on it from our website. New York, which we all know is a very big hotbed, is all the way down here at the bottom. Maine, Vermont, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, New York, Rhode Island, Connecticut, D.C., New Jersey. Those are all the worst locations nationwide uh, from the CDC. They have the lowest percentage because they are testing everyone every day before you can go into work before you go to school. They're testing nonstop. So doing it based on the percentage of testing is misleading. Uh, that's a little concern, but that's where we are. But it is a lot better information than what was on there before. Be careful with going on the travel advisories from the state because they're not including above 10 um, and they're not including everyone with the right numbers. Go to Johns Hopkins and check the actual number that was on that screen. All right. Kentucky updates, new executive orders, some of these are big. Uh, they modified restaurants and bars last calls now at 11 o'clock on the 15th. They also came out with public facing businesses no longer include youth sports, but youth sports now has to adhere to healthy sports guidance for K through 12, as well as the KHSAA healthy at sports guidance for K through eight. Bizarre thing is I have a whole lot of a whole lot of background with KHSAA they don't have anything to do with K through eight. I actually had a lawsuit directly involving the fact that they have no authority over any student until that student is in the ninth grade. And yet they have supposedly issued guidance for K through eight. I don't know what our high school athletic association would have to do with a kindergartner, but that's what our, that's what the policy is on the state. Um, new executive order on the 14th, uh, was entered regarding, uh, sorry about the typo, COVID-19 uh, reporting mandate for parents. You have 24 hours to report to the school. I don't know what they're going to do if you don't report it, but you have 24 hours to report it. Part of this mandate from the governor is what I've been begging for as well. There's now uniformity in the reporting structure. There's a pro, uh, uh, secure portal that's being provided to the schools, both universities and high school, middle school, elementary, so on. Uh, so that's what we had asked for. And it also has guidance for school reopening. So long as the positivity rate is less than 6%, they've given brand new guidance to schools on how to reopen. If the positivity rate stays less than six, check that out. If it's important to you, there's new pages on the website, which are much better than they were before uh, with regard to proper reporting for K through 12 and college. They're still under uh, construction. Some of the links are not yet up. Some of the information is not yet there. And then the Healthy at Work page. This is the interesting thing too. Um, pull that back up on the screen really quick. The Healthy at Work page, if I can get it, whoops, that's the school one, sorry. Uh, one second. I lost it. The Healthy at Work page has been changed. Is this it? No. Sorry, this is what happens when I close out too quick. The Healthy at Work page, if you scroll down to the bottom, 
and you learn more. This is on the page the new guidance from the, the uh, state. In order to have a healthy at work, you must enforce social distance. Some of these are common sense. Uh, you must use universal face coverings, hand sanitizer, proper sanitation, and daily temperature health screening. The problem is, as I point out, let me drop this down. Drop that down too, sorry. There is no mandate. There is no executive order from our governor. So the executive order is still law. May 11, 2020 is the last law we have on employers, but yet on the Healthy at Work page, they're now saying you're down to enforce social distance, use universal face coverings, use hand sanitizer and proper sanitation, and do daily temperature and health screening. I would not, if I were you, rely upon a web page as your basis for why you no longer have to adhere to the governor's mandate because you have an executive order that takes control instead of a simple web page. But this changed after we pointed out to them that they needed to get information out there to, this, to the companies because you can't continue to have something governed by May 11th. So this did change. But how it changes, I don't know, uh, because I don't know how to, com how to compare a governor's mandate with a governor's um, uh, web page. If you're asking the attorney in me, you can't go on the web page. You've got an executive order which carries the full force of law until the Supreme Court raises it. You've got an executive order that has 14 things you have to do. You have to have that healthy at work officer and if you can't comply with all 14, you can't open. But the web page has been changed to suggest that you have four things you have to do or you can't stay open. Uh, so stay tuned. I would be willing to bet that um, uh, there will be some changes to that page and to a new executive order. I think it's just taking a while because of the number. I want to put that up there so you see it as well. The healthy at work, if you look at the requirements and it says click below, look at the different business, these are executive order business directives that have been entered. He would have to basically clean all of those up. I'm sorry, those are all the directives under the executive order and then here are your executive orders that have been entered. All of these are bar, basically bar related. Um, these are all your Bars are at 10%, bars can't open, bars are at 50%, bars go back to 10%, all that different things that we watched in June and July, as well as the face coverings. That's going to take some time to fix. Uh, question. Uh, executive order, sorry, we're done with the page. Let me move on to the questions and answers. I'm going to move on to the end so that you guys can actually get your codes while we're doing these. The question about executive order including private schools, the answer is yes, at least it was intended to. Whether someone is going to challenge those uh, will be seen, but the, the governor's order was all public school, or I'm sorry, all schooling between K through 12. I didn't see anything in there. I could be wrong because all these things are flying at me very quickly. Uh, but I believe it was all schools. It's not mandatory. Correction. If your child's sick, it's mandatory. The guidance is guidance. So the reopening of schools was nothing but guidance. You don't have to adhere to it. So that's both public and private. The mandatory reporting is a health safety concern. So I believe that that was across the board, public and private. And I don't believe that you can get out of it. Uh, see a question on there about the difference between vertical and horizontal. Vertical basically is uh, you work for me, but then I place you somewhere else. So I'm going to go back to that. So vertical is where an employee has an employment relationship with one, typically a staffing agency, subcontractor, or labor provider, and the economic realities are that he's working for the other. Uh, so that's vertical, meaning you work for one, 
you're placed with the the real employer but for paper reasons um, payroll unemployment uh, health insurance unions uh, instead of having all of those things the employers hired a temporary subcontractor or a temporary staffing agency to have those employees work for them the example I'll give you is uh, automotive uh, factory floor uh, they used to be all unionized they used to have employees that if they had to lay off those employees basically would just not work but they get paid to work because they're in a union instead what they've done now is they have a core set of employees that work on the factory floor those are all employees they're supervisors they're long term and then they have peak and valley seasons so they hire temporary employees to fill the the factory floor whether it's putting widgets on or painting something or whatever they're doing then if they have to lay those people off they're not employed by the main employer they're employed by temporary staffing so they're not equal employers you actually are hired paid and uh, controlled by one but the other one the actual factory runs everything day to day gets to tell you what to do how to do it you're on their show floor etc Horizontal are really two equal situations. You're not working under the control of one, but both of you get to control at the same time. It's a little complex, but it's basically the employee has a relationship with two employers, and so they both are controlled. Uh, so if you think about it, um, trying to come up with a good example, but you could be working for one employer being paid hourly for that employer and also working for another one being paid by that one if they both jointly have you doing something for both of them at the same time they're both responsible even if one's paying you and one's not think of it like if you work for a wholly owned subsidiary of one company uh, and yet you're doing work for the other one so if i work for abc company and it's wholly owned by or jointly owned by another uh, that would be more horizontal. It's not a vertical. It's not a lack of control. It's it's not a temporary placement. I'm doing work for both, and I can be held responsible by both. They're equal employers instead of one being the overarching control and the other one simply finding hired finding hired help and putting them in that facility. Jim, you want to so, get that last slide up? Yep, I'm going to put it back up. I just want to show the vertical and horizontal again. Uh, yeah, so the question about being in the uh, mental health facility, yeah, you can now split that out where some of your people are going to not be in the health facility if they are not related in patient care directly. Um, it does change some of that. Your, um, slides, your slides are stuck on that uh, page oh, of the governor's. Oops, uh, sorry. Stuff. No slides. My no bad. slides. There you go. I forgot. I'm not looking at that screen, so I didn't see that there were no slides. I thought um, you were yeah, trying to put something else up, too, but it wasn't coming up. So, okay. Okay. So, uh, the question about health facilities, the answer is yes, you now fall, if you have less than 500 employees, you now fall under FFCRA for those employees that do not have a health field designation under the FMLA or are not directly involved in the care treatment services of patients. So, I kind of looked at that, and this is a rough don't take me word for word, but basically if you're a secretary, a receptionist, uh, telephone answering, you're not involved in the direct day-to-day -day care treatment uh, services of a patient. If, on the other hand, you are a nurse, a technician, a doctor, uh, a pharmacist, someone who is involved, then that individual does not fall under FFCRA, but your organization may then that's something you need to get guidance on because it's brand new uh, that the FFCRA, um, the definition of employees, not just employers, has now changed. So you need to take a look at that and make sure. Get some uh, one one-on-one -on -one guidance because it's going to be very carefully worded as to how to handle that. 
Um, is there anything else you want to? I don't. I couldn't catch all of the. Uh, Let's see if questions. Allison has some questions captured. Sure. Allison, do you yeah. have any others? Yes. Um, so I'm going to go backwards a little bit and talk about confidentiality when you were talking about employers trying to keep um, employee information confidential. Question is, what do you do if the infected employee contacts those individuals they could have exposed themselves? And should we advise employees to reach out to HR first? You should, invi you should advise those employees of their right to privacy and you should advise those employees of the need for confidentiality and the way that you're handling it. You cannot stop someone from disclosing their own, just like you can't stop somebody from coming into work and saying, I'm pregnant or I have cancer or, uh, you know, my spouse just got COVID or I just got COVID. You can't stop it. It's your job not to spread it. So if the employee is contacting coworkers and saying, hey, I tested positive, you need to stay at home. You can't stop them, but you can tell them, look, we're handling this in a very careful manner. We don't want to needlessly disclose who you are. We're asking, we're doing our contact tracing. We're keeping your confidentiality. We would ask that you go through us and allow us to do our job. Don't punish them if they don't, because if they want to go tell everybody and their brother they have COVID, you really can't stop them from doing that. Great. Um, and then we've got a couple of FFCRA questions. All right. So I had one about um, the FFCRA classification. So an employee has a spouse who's experiencing symptoms and seeking diagnosis. The employee is not allowed to report to work while waiting on results based on screening questions. Um, employee then seeks diagnosis, although no symptoms. Do they qualify for FFCRA leave? Yes, um, and I answered that a little bit, but I wanted to pull it up if I can find them. I've got several open on my screen to go back to the, uh, um, let me see if I've got one. Uh, basically, that person could qualify under FFCRA under three different areas. One is that they are being advised by an agency to self-quarantine. The other is that they are actually, uh, I'm trying to pull it up, so if you see bouncing around, just bear with me. Um, let's see. The other is that they have a spouse that if they are caring for their spouse or in need to care for their spouse, then they would qualify under the, uh, uh, the spousal care or the family care. If, on the other hand, that they are actively being tested, they themselves fall under their own symptoms or actively seeking medical treatment for those potential symptoms. So that individual, technically speaking, could fall under three different areas of the FFCRA. <laughs> okay, great. Um, and then I had a private question, um, and I'm not sure if this is, if there's a clear thing to point to for the guidance or if this is more of an opinion question, but um, if an employee's child, if they've returned to work, the school has reopened and the child is back at school, but the school closes down due to either COVID numbers or a COVID exposure, that there's nothing pointing to the student being directly affected by COVID. Is there a reason that the employee would be unable to report to work if yes. they Yep, because the FFCRA specifically exempts employees who have to care for a child whose school is closed. Right, that but goes I think back. The, oh, sorry. I think the question is if they have a nanny or the child's old enough to stay home and the employee wants to report to work, is there any reason the employer should restrict them from doing so? No. No, it's the employee's right to stay at home it is not the employee's job to stay at home. And I also want to clarify, uh, Rachel in there said that the, they don't have any COVID, they don't have COVID symptoms. This relates to the employee um, staying at home, but the doctor recommended they work from home due to being immunocompromised. The answer there is if they have a doctor recommendation to stay at home due to being immunocompromised, then they are under recommendation from a doctor to quarantine or to stay away from work. 
if you can reasonably accommodate by allowing them to stay at home, then you have an obligation to do so. If they cannot do the essential functions of their job, then that falls under the, the EEOC guidance that I just talked about earlier. Um, that's a case-by-case -case determination, but you're going to want to document which parts of the job they can't do from home, and you also want to make darn sure that you're treating that person the same as everyone else because you don't want to get hit with litigation because you didn't follow the exact same procedures for all employees in a similar situation. Okay, and then we had another FFCRA question. Um, an employee stays home with a child that is sick and being tested, so they're paid at two-thirds wages for the days missed. Are the hours, the 80 hours, the same for this category or only if they are sick themselves? Um, that's a different, uh, it's 80 hours sick themselves plus or total 12 weeks of pay to take care of a child or to otherwise be out. So remember, we're talking 12 full weeks of EFMLEA. So you have to make sure you're keeping adequate track of the two weeks sick leave, which is the 80 hours, plus the additional 10 weeks of either sick leave, FMLA leave to care for themselves or care for others. So they have the ability to piggyback to get a total of 12 and remember just little going back to what we talked about for six months now remember the 12 weeks is total this is not an additional fmla this is just an expansion of the previous fmla an employee only gets 12. i suspect a lot of you are going to start to have employees and this is what we talked about in the middle of august if Congress doesn't get its act together and adopt a new FFCRA, a lot of your employees are going to start to run out of time in the middle of October because they used four to six weeks from April 1st until school was out. So four to six weeks last spring. And then when school started, a lot of you have employees using uh, the EFMLEA because the schools are closed until October in Fayette County and some of the others, you're going to have employees run up against that 12-week total. Uh, keep that in mind. The other thing to keep in mind, I know there's no question on it, but just remember the difference between a forced closed school doing uh, remote learning and a school that has offered an option. If the school's offering an option, you may not be able to get reimbursed from the federal government dollar for dollar for paying that employee because the school's not actually closed. They're open and you are voluntarily overpaying that employee to stay at home. Uh, that's something you need to document very carefully. All right, we've got a couple more coming in. Um, can we address it with other employees if they're talking about an employee's diagnosis? For example, an employee tells details to coworker they were in contact with and that employee spreads the information. Yeah, you need to stop the spread of that information to the best of your ability so that you're doing your job to maintain confidentiality. So what you're going to want to do is probably to do a blanket description to everyone saying, look, if you hear of anyone having COVID, remember the confidentiality in the workplace related to anyone's exposure. So we're asking you not to spread that information. Come to HR and allow us to handle it. If an employee tells a coworker and tells the coworker to tell everyone else, I don't know that you want to get involved in punishing it, but you do want to tell them your official stance as an employer is you don't want to have anybody talking about those things. That's kind of the way you're going to have to do it. Um, Intermittent leave struggling. I'm going to cover that one really quick. Child in school, buses are not running. They have to take leave to pick them up. Um, yeah. So the answer would be you've got two choices there. I gave employees uh, instruction this morning on a webinar, not webinar, uh, conference call this morning at 9 o'clock. My advice to them was expand your day. So as an employee of two choices, expand your day to cover the eight hours you're supposed to do with your intermittent leave or you're going to be paid two-thirds until you run out of time 
So the answer there is you can't force them to do, if they tell you they need intermittent leave between 2.45 and 5 o'clock, uh, let them use it, but they are running out of time when they're using it, meaning that they only have, uh, they only have 12 weeks of time. The one about being sick, allergies, they get it every year. Doctor recommends testing and says to stay uh, quarantined. That's the one I hate because it's really easy right now for these doctors to just say, yeah, just quarantine, just quarantine, just quarantine. But if you have a quarantine order from a doctor and then the employee turns out to be positive and you didn't adhere to the quarantine, um, that exposes you to liability for anyone who gets it. My recommendation is to follow up with that doctor, force their hand a little bit. Remember under FMLA and the FMLEA, you have the opportunity to question a doctor. So if he's literally, and it's become really easy for he or she to just check boxes, I've seen them, and they're basically just pre-checking the box saying recommend quarantine, recommend quarantine, recommend quarantine. My recommendation is pick up the phone and call them. Hey, I got this from you. Can you give me some information as to why this person should quarantine when they've told me it's just allergy related? What other symptomology did you see that led you to this belief? Force their hand. Otherwise, you're stuck with the quarantine recommendation or you're exposing yourself to liability. Uh, you always have the right to question the doctor to determine reasonable accommodations and to follow up on the diagnosis. Don't do it without questioning the doctor. If they stand by their quarantine, tell the employee you're going to have to quarantine uh, or try to figure out telework or get that person, to, that employee to go back to the doctor and say, I don't want to quarantine. Force them to do it. Anything else? Mm -hmm. I sent you a couple of questions that are detailed to see if they're ones that you want to address or. Let's see. Um, if an employee has direct exposure but was not contacted by a medical professional or health department, do they qualify? The answer is yes, but they you should require them to go get treated, go get tested, and get recommendation from their medical care provider or whoever it is that's doing the test. Remember, you now have the opportunity to not just screen, but to require your employees to get tested before they come in. So if that employee has been directly exposed, before you allow them to come into work, make them go to a doctor and get tested. Uh, next one, an employee six says it's out. We just answered that one. Uh, if you're caring for an individual, how long can that person be paid for the two-thirds wages? Ten weeks or 12 weeks, depending on whether they've taken the sick leave at the 80 hours. Um, wait, there's one that says again or again, again. I don't know which, one, <laughs> which answer that was. I think it's referencing the Catherine Lanier had said CDC just reversed the airborne spread statement. Probably again, again, knowing them, it's every day. Um, so I don't know, go to their website and they may reverse, reverse the reversal of the reversal. Um, right in the top of their website, CDC makes a major change to guidance saying COVID-19 can spread through the air. Oh, that's the reversal I already talked about. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's the one uh, I was looking for it. It's on Friday. Yeah, that, that was as of 8.57 a.m. today. Yeah, they, they put it on their website because that was where everybody said, wow, they didn't even say anything uh, uh, on their website. They just slipped it in there. But that is the airborne one is the one that we covered on slide. Hold on just a second. This one. This is the uh, reverse course on its late directive declaring again that individuals within six feet, uh, six feet must be tested and then the other one is that it is airborne. Those are the two things they announced on Friday. Well, let's, let's go with it. Oh, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Somebody says that they've reversed course on the aerosol saying it's not now aerosol. Is, uh, that's what it looks like. 
So welcome to why I said I'm pretty frustrated with the CDC because it's literally like every single day, every single, everything changes and it's impossible. Let's see if I can find it on their page. Nope. It's somewhere on there. Mm -hmm. So, like I said, check their website. It's it's literally changing by the minute. So, well, I wouldn't change that. I would say, protect yourself. Yeah. All right. We'll put the Any other questions? Slide back up. Other questions? I think that's all we've got. <laughs>